Section twenty four of History of Egypt, Volume two by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter two The Memphite Empire, Part twelve. These repeated expeditions produced in course of time more important and permanent results than the capture of an accomplished dwarf or the acquisition of a fortune by an adventurous nobleman. The nations which these merchants visited were accustomed to hear so much of Egypt, its industries and its military force, that they came at last to entertain an admiration and respect for her, not unmingled with fear. They learned to look upon her as a power superior to all others, and upon her king as a god whom none might resist. They adopted Egyptian worship, yielded to Egypt their homage, and sent the Egyptians presents. They were won over by civilization before being subdued by arms. We are not acquainted with the manner in which Nofirkiri Papi II turned these friendly dispositions to good account in extending his empire to the south. The expeditions did not all prove so successful as that of Herkuf, and one at least of the princes of Elephantine, Papi Nakhiti, met with his death in the course of one of them. Papi II had sent him on a mission, after several others, to make profit out of the Ua'iu and the Iritit. He killed considerable numbers in this raid, and brought back great spoil, which he shared with Pharaoh, for he was at the head of many warriors chosen from among the bravest, which was the cause of his success in the enterprise with which His Holiness had deigned to entrust him. Once, however, the king employed him in regions which were not so familiar to him as those of Nubia, and fate was against him. He had received orders to visit the Amu, the Asiatic tribes inhabiting the Sinaitic Peninsula, and to repeat on a smaller scale in the south the expedition which Uni had led against them in the north. He proceeded thither, and his sojourn having come to an end, he chose to return by sea. To sail towards Puanit, to coast up as far as the head of Nekhabit, and to land there and make straight for Elephantine by the shortest route, presented no unusual difficulties and doubtless more than one traveller or general of those times had safely accomplished it. Papi Nakhiti failed miserably. As he was engaged in constructing his vessel, the Hiru Shaitu fell upon him and massacred him, as well as the detachment of troops who accompanied him. The remaining soldiers brought home his body, which was buried by the side of the other princes in the mountain opposite Syene. Papi II had ample leisure to avenge the death of his vassal and to send fresh expeditions to Iritit, among the Amamit and even beyond, if indeed, as the author of the chronological canon of Turin asserts, he really reigned for more than ninety years. But the monuments are almost silent with regard to him, and give us no information about his possible exploits in Nubia. An inscription of his second year proves that he continued to work the Sinaitic mines, and that he protected them from the Bedouin. On the other hand, the number and beauty of the tombs in which mention is made of him bear witness to the fact that Egypt enjoyed continued prosperity. Recent discoveries have done much to surround this king and his immediate predecessors with an air of reality which is lacking in many of the later pharaohs. Their pyramids, whose familiar designations we have deciphered in the texts, have been uncovered at Saqqara, and the inscriptions which they contain reveal to us the names of the sovereigns who reposed within. Unas, Teddy the Third, Papi the First, Metasophus the First, and Papi the Second, now have as clearly defined a personality for us as Ramesses the Second or Seti the First. Even the mummy of Metasophus has been discovered near his sarcophagus, and can be seen under glass in the Giza Museum. The body is thin and slender, the head refined, and ornamented with the thick side-lock of boyhood. The features can be easily distinguished, although the lower jaw has disappeared and the pressure of the bandages has flattened the nose. All the pyramids of the dynasty are of a uniform type, the model being furnished by that of Unas. The entrance is in the center of the northern façade, underneath the lowest course, and on the ground level. An inclined passage, obstructed by enormous stones, leads to an antechamber, whose walls are partly bare and partly covered with long columns of hieroglyphs. A level passage, blocked towards the middle by three granite barriers, ends in a nearly square chamber. On the left are three low cells devoid of ornament, and on the right an oblong chamber containing the sarcophagus. These two principal rooms had high-pitched roofs. They were composed of large slabs of limestone, 
the upper edges of which leaned one against the other, while the lower edges rested on a continuous ledge which ran round the chamber. The first row of slabs was surmounted by a second, and that again by a third, and the three together effectively protected the apartments of the dead against the thrust of the superincumbent mass, or from the attacks of robbers. The wall surfaces close to the sarcophagus in the pyramid of Unas are decorated with many-coloured ornaments, and sculptured and painted doors representing the front of a house. This was, in fact, the dwelling of the double, in which he resided with the dead body. The inscriptions, like the pictures in the tombs, were meant to furnish the sovereign with provisions, to dispel servants and malevolent divinities, to keep his soul from death, and to lead him into the bark of the sun, or into the paradise of Osiris. They constitute a portion of a vast book, whose chapters are found scattered over the monuments of subsequent periods. They are the means of restoring to us, not only the religion, but the most ancient language of Egypt. The majority of the formulas contained in them were drawn up in the time of the earliest human kings, perhaps even before Menes. The history of the sixth dynasty loses itself in legend and fable. Two more kings are supposed to have succeeded Pafi Noferkiri, Mirniri, Mitim Saut, Metasophus II, and Nitokrit, Nitokris. Metasophus II was killed, so runs the tale, in a riot a year after his accession. His sister, Nitokris, the rosy-cheeked, to whom, as was the custom, he was married, succeeded him and avenged his death. She built an immense subterranean hall, under pretext of inaugurating its completion, but in reality with a totally different aim. She then invited to a great feast, and received in this hall, a considerable number of Egyptians from among those whom she knew to have been instigators of the crime. During the entertainment, she diverted the waters of the Nile into the hall by means of a canal, which she had kept concealed. This is what is related of her. They add that after this, the queen, of her own will, threw herself into a great chamber filled with ashes, in order to escape punishment. She completed the pyramid of Mykerinos, by adding to it that costly casing of cyanite, which excited the admiration of travellers. She reposed in a sarcophagus of blue basalt, in the very centre of the monument, above the secret chamber where the pious pharaoh had hidden his mummy. The Greeks, who had heard from their dragomans the story of the rosy-cheeked beauty, metamorphosed the princess into a courtesan, and for the name of Nitocris, substituted the more harmonious one of Rhodopis, which was the exact translation of the characteristic epithet of the Egyptian queen. One day, while she was bathing in the river, an eagle stole one of her gilded sandals, carried it off in the direction of Memphis, and let it drop in the lap of the king, who was administering justice in the open air. The king, astonished at the singular occurrence, and at the beauty of the tiny shoe, caused a search to be made throughout the country for the woman to whom it belonged. Rhodopis thus became queen of Egypt, and could build herself a pyramid. Even Christianity and the Arab conquest did not entirely efface the remembrance of the courtesan princess. It is said that the spirit of the southern pyramid never appears abroad, except in the form of a naked woman, who is very beautiful, but whose manner of acting is such, that when she desires to make people fall in love with her and lose their wits, she smiles upon them, and immediately they draw near to her, and she attracts them towards her, and makes them infatuated with love, so that they at once lose their wits, and wander aimlessly about the country. Many have seen her moving round the pyramid about midday and towards sunset. It is Nitocris still haunting the monument of her shame and her magnificence. After her even tradition is silent, and the history of Egypt remains a mere blank for several centuries. Manetho admits the existence of two other Memphite dynasties, of which the first contains seventy kings during as many days. Acthoas, the most cruel of tyrants, followed next, and oppressed his subjects for a long period. He was at last the victim of raving madness, and met with his death from the jaws of a crocodile. It is related that he was of Heracleopolite extraction, and the two dynasties which succeeded him, the ninth and the tenth, were also Heracleopolitan. The table of Abydos is incomplete, and the Turin papyrus, in the absence of other documents, too mutilated to furnish us with any exact information, the contemporaries of the Ptolemies were almost entirely ignorant of what took place between the end of the sixth and the beginning of the twelfth dynasty, 
and Egyptologists, not finding any monuments which they could attribute to this period, thereupon concluded that Egypt had passed through some formidable crisis, out of which she with difficulty extracted herself. The so-called Heracleopolitites of Manetho were assumed to have been the chiefs of a barbaric people of Asiatic origin, those same lords of the sands so roughly handled by Uni, but who are considered to have invaded the delta soon after, settled themselves in Heracleopolitus Parva as their capital, and from thence held sway over the whole valley. They appeared to have destroyed much and built nothing. The state of barbarism into which they sank, and to which they reduced the vanquished, explaining the absence of any monuments to mark their occupation. This hypothesis, however, is unsupported by any direct proof. Even the dearth of monuments which has been cited as an argument in favor of the theory is no longer a fact. The sequence of reigns and details of the revolutions are wanting, but many of the kings and certain facts in their history are known, and we are able to catch a glimpse of the general course of events. The seventh and eighth dynasties are Memphite, and the names of the kings themselves would be evidence in favor of their genuineness, even if we had not the direct testimony of Manetho. The one recurring most frequently is that of Nofercuri, the prenom of Papi the Second, and a third Papi figures in them, who calls himself Papi Sonbu to distinguish himself from his namesakes. The little recorded of them in Ptolemaic times, even the legend of the seventy pharaohs reigning seventy days, betrays a troublous period and a rapid change of rulers. We know as a fact that the successors of Nitocris, in the royal Turin papyrus, scarcely did more than appear upon the throne. Nofercuri reigned a year, a month, and a day. Nofiris, four years, two months, and a day. Abu, two years, one month, and a day. Each of them hoped, no doubt, to enjoy the royal power for a longer period than his predecessors, and, like the Ati of the sixth dynasty, ordered a pyramid to be designed for him without delay. Not one of them had time to complete the building, nor even to carry it sufficiently far to leave any trace behind. As none of them had any tomb to hand his name down to posterity, the remembrance of them perished with their contemporaries. By dint of such frequent changes in the succession, the royal authority became enfeebled, and its weakness favored the growing influence of the feudal families, and encouraged their ambition. The descendants of those great lords, who under Poppy I and II made such magnificent tombs for themselves, were only nominally subject to the supremacy of the reigning sovereign. Many of them were, indeed, grandchildren of princesses of the blood, and possessed, or imagined that they possessed, as good a right to the crown as the family on the throne. Memphis declined, became impoverished, and dwindled in population. Its inhabitants ceased to build those immense stone mastabas in which they had proudly displayed their wealth, and erected them merely of brick, in which the decoration was almost entirely confined to one narrow niche near the sarcophagus. Soon the mastaba itself was given up, and the necropolis of the city was reduced to the meagre proportions of a small provincial cemetery. The centre of that government, which had weighed so long and so heavily upon Egypt, was removed to the south, and fixed itself at Heracleopolis the Great. End of section 24. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.